And as we wrap up this, uh, this journey, uh, we see that in the last, these last three weeks that we're going to be talking about different aspects of a disciple's life. Uh, because in these last two chapters or so, Jesus has very personal interactions, not with the masses, as we've seen throughout the Gospel of John. He has very personal interactions with his disciples after his resurrection. Uh, and so I wanted to take some time to talk about what we can learn from these interactions. And so we're going to be in John chapter 20, starting in verse 19. Uh, would you stand with me as we read God's word? John chapter 20, starting in verse 19. When it was evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. John said to them again, or Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were telling him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, if I don't see the mark of the nails in his hands, put my finger in the mark of the nails and put my hand in his side, I will never believe. A week later, his disciples were indoors again and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. Thomas responded to him. My Lord and my God. Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these were written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. You may be seated. Jesus appears to his disciples and, you know, throughout the different gospel accounts of this, John, John takes some of the hysteria out of the passage. We know that from other, from other accounts that when Jesus appeared in the room with the disciples, they lost their minds. They freaked out, to put it in deep theological terms. They were scared. They immediately thought, it's a ghost. And Jesus is like, guys, it's not a ghost, it's me. We've done this before. I've shown up when you didn't expect me to. But Jesus is now saying, listen, I'm, this is real. I have been raised from the dead. I am among you in this moment. And then it's interesting what Jesus does. Jesus does not spend times with the disciples saying, okay, guys, this is how it happened. This is how I came back to life. He doesn't spend time with the disciples telling them what he was doing while he was dead. Did he go somewhere spiritually? Did he descend into Hades and proclaim victory to the spirits that were imprisoned there since the days of Noah? As Peter tells us later on in his letter, Jesus doesn't cover any of that ground. Instead, what does he do? He begins to tell the disciples what comes next. Jesus always focused on the Father's mission, always focused on helping other people see what God is planning to do, always helping people become what God intends for them to become. Jesus is not content to sit around and have philosophical or hypothetical or fanciful conversations. He is simply, peace be with you. And then he says it again, peace be with you. As my father sent me, so I send you. Today we're going to be looking at a disciple's purpose. What can we learn about what the original disciples were supposed to be doing? And by extension, what we are supposed to be doing? Because as we've said before, the job description of the church has not changed in 2,000 years. It, it's no different 
Yes, that we have different methodology. Yes, we have different technology that helps the church do different things. And sometimes we can get confused. Sometimes Christians can think we're doing God's work when we have the biggest and best building. When we have the newest and sharpest technology. We're doing God's work when we have the biggest congregation we could possibly have, when we have more people in our services than anybody else in town. And I want you to know, you can have all those things and Jesus could have nothing to do with it. You can have a big, nice building. You can have a lot of people. You can have, you know, 30-foot LED walls. And Jesus doesn't have, doesn't have to be there for any of that. I also want to tell you that just because you have those things doesn't mean that you're not with Jesus. Okay, Jesus doesn't hate technology, he doesn't hate crowds, he doesn't hate nice buildings. What matters most is that God's people are faithful to the purpose that he sets out. And as we live out that purpose, it looks differently. The fruit born by your faithfulness looks different than the fruit born by someone else's faithfulness. That the gospel is supposed to go forth. And so here's the simple reality for the disciples that Jesus is speaking to in the upper room or in this room. And the disciples that the Holy Spirit is speaking to in this room. Every disciple is sent. Every single disciple is sent. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. He didn't say, Peter and John and Matthew, you three, you're, the, you're sent. The other handful of you, you're nobodies. I mean, you three are going to have books with your names on them. You other guys, you're going to be just footnotes in the history Thomas, everybody's going to think you're a loser. Because that's what we think of Thomas, right? What do we call Thomas? Doubting. Doubting Thomas. Do you know how unfair that is? The other disciples didn't believe either until Jesus showed up. Right? Thomas was just, he just wasn't there that day. He just repeated the same kind of stuff. Like, listen, I don't know that I believe you. Like, I'm going to need proof. The same proof that Jesus gave those other disciples and Jesus graciously shows back and go, up and gives to Thomas. Jesus does say to Thomas, don't be faithless, but believe. Do you know how many times he said that to, this, to the disciples throughout their entire ministry? <laughs> Countless times. How about the time that Peter got out of the boat and walked on water to Jesus? And then Peter starts to sink and drowned, Jesus rescues him. They get back in the boat. And what does Jesus say to Peter? Oh, why, why do you doubt you of little faith? Faith is something that the disciples continually struggle with. And it's something you and I continually struggle with. We are no different. Jesus says, every disciple is sent. As my father sent me, so I am sending you. I would love for there to be a loophole. The selfish side of me, the side that loves comfort, the side that loves to just talk and not act, the side that likes to have theoretical, philosophical, hypothetical conversations, but never get off my rear and do anything. That side of me would love for there to be some kind of escape clause in this, and there's not. Jesus says, the Father sent me, I send you. It's as plain as day. Every disciple is sent. Some disciples are going to be more well-known than others. Some disciples are going to have greater faith than others. Some disciples are going to be more eloquent than others. Some disciples are going to have a more prolific ministry than others. But none of that means that, not, that we're not all sent. None of that means the fact that we can tend to compare ourselves to other people. None of that negates the reality that Jesus Christ declared that we are all supposed to go and tell. Just like we talked about in last week's sermon. He appears to Mary Magdalene and says, go and tell. From the very beginning of Jesus' resurrected ministry, he's telling people, go and tell. Go and tell. Go and tell. You are sent out with a message. 
Every single disciple is sent. And what does being sent look like? It looks entirely different. Some disciples may have never left Jerusalem. Many of them did. Peter left Jerusalem. Had a prolific ministry and then was crucified upside down as church history tells us. The Apostle John had the longest running ministry. He lived, church history believes, into his 90s. Many of the other original 12 disciples were martyred. Some in India, some in Asia, all over the place. And we would love to We'd love to know what being sent looks like. We'd love to have every detail in place. We'd love to know how the interactions are going to go. We'd love to know that how people are going to respond. And the fact is, is that none of that is promised to you. None of that is promised to us. Jesus actually answers the, hey, where are you going to send us? He says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, He says, you'll be my witnesses. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. (laughs) Jesus says, here and there and then everywhere. That's the reality. That's the idea of having dominion over the earth that we see in Revelation, or not Revelation, other end of the book, Genesis When Adam and Eve were told to go and have dominion over the whole earth, the idea was that they were to go and cause it to submit to God. That's what the idea of dominion, to work the way it was designed to work. And all of creation was designed to work under the authority and power and within the law of God. And now, as Jesus is resurrected in Matthew chapter 28, he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. You're to go to every nation and make disciples or do whatever you can to make sure as many people as possible submit to the law and the truth of God's word through the preaching of the gospel. God's plan has always been to subdue the earth with his grace and goodness and kindness and holiness. That's always been the plan. You know, uh, a few years ago, I was stuck in traffic when we lived up in the Denton area. And if you've driven through Denton, you know that it's awful. Uh, And uh, I was stuck for like 20 minutes at a red light for no apparent reason. I was stuck behind a Sherwin-Williams truck, the paint company. And uh, you guys know, and I was struck by the picture on the, on the back of the truck. It was a picture of the earth and a bucket of red paint being poured over the North Pole. And it's starting to cover the Northern Hemisphere. You know what Sherwin-Williams logo is? Their motto is? Cover the earth. And I was struck by that picture. The idea of this red paint covering the earth and and the Holy Spirit in that moment was like, that's what the church is supposed to be doing. (laughs) We're supposed to be covering the earth with the good news of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We are sent to do that very thing. Now, when I say sent, we have been trained so well in our Southern Baptist life to think missionaries, They were sent as missionaries and we think of exotic destinations and those aren't bad. We think of, you know, Southeast Asia or, or Ecuador or Africa. We think of all these other places, but Jesus, the Bible doesn't say that you are sent as missionaries. What does the Bible say you are sent as? If you've, if you've got a chance, turn over to second Corinthians chapter six, I would put it on the screen, but I did not put it in the email to Charlotte. So that's on me. Second Corinthians chapter five, second Corinthians chapter five, Paul tells us through the Holy Spirit exactly what we are sent out as. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 16. From now on then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. Even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet now we know him no longer this way. 
Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Everything is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us this ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We are sent as ambassadors. You may say, what's the difference between an ambassador and a missionary? Well, first off, ambassador is the word scripture uses. Missionary is not a bad word. But ambassador is the word used for all of us. He's used for all of us. Now remember, he's writing to the church at Corinth. This is the second letter that they've received from Paul. What was the first letter? The first letter was, y'all are messed up. The first letter was, you guys, you, you guys are doing everything wrong. You can't even get the Lord's Supper right. You're fighting over everything. You're reveling in your acceptance of sin. There is nothing but dysfunction. You're using your freedom to trample over other believers. You guys are the worst church ever. Paul doesn't say that, but it's definitely the harshest pastoral correction that we see in the New Testament. They are failing at being faithful. This is the same group of believers that he's writing to now. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, I wrote you and you were wounded and you were grieved and I, I wasn't trying to grieve you but I'm thankful that you were grieved because that grief, that sorrow led to repentance and that repentance led to life in your fellowship. You have turned. You've turned away from yourself and you've returned to faithfulness to Christ. It's these dysfunctional believers who are striving to follow Jesus more closely. It's to these believers who have not always gotten everything right. They've proven themselves to be fickle and full of faults. It's this group of believers that he says, you are an ambassador of reconciliation. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to feel some supernatural sense of calling to be a missionary. You, by divine declaration, as a believer in Jesus Christ, having the Holy Spirit inside of you, are declared and appointed an ambassador. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is a position that carries a message by some head of state, by some king, by some authority. You are sent with that message. Not your own message. You have no authority in, your, in and of yourself. You are appointed by someone higher than you to go and tell. To carry with you the policies and the laws and the mandates of someone in a higher authority over you. Church, that ought to bring us comfort. So many of us are so sheepish when it comes to being vocal ambassadors for this, mes for this message of reconciliation because we think it's all up to us. You think that you've got to know everything and you've got to have every answer that anybody could ever ask and that you've got to know every stitch of scripture and the reality is that you, is that you don't. You carry with you a message that's been given to you. Now I'm not telling you to you can just turn off your brain and go through life on autopilot. Being an ambassador requires intentionality. God gives you directions. You've got to follow them. Because it's not just the things you say. It's also how the things that God has said changes your life. You know, a few months back, we, we outlined what our, our vision statement is for our church. And the mission is to make disciples. But how are we going to do that in where God, where God has put us at this time? It's that we follow Jesus, we strengthen families, and that we transform lives. That begins by you and I following Jesus faithfully as individuals. 
And then together, we provide ministries and, and we run to help families across our community to strengthen them, not just so that we give them stuff, but that we give them truth. That we demonstrate that we love them. And by while we love them, by giving them angel tree stuff or holiday meal baskets or whatever it is that God gives us the opportunity to supply to them, that we also give them the truth, that we also tell them why we're doing it. And we're doing it because Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, died on the cross for their sins so that they might be rescued from the wrath of God and that they might be made a new creation by faith in Jesus Christ. That's what it means. An ambassador carries out the message and the mission given to him or her by the one in authority. And this is the message, verse 20 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Be reconciled to God. Something that needs reconciliation means it's broken. Reconciliation literally means to put the pieces back together. That we're not just at a step with God. Our relationship with God has been shattered by sin. It's broken, broken beyond repair on our end. The only one who could put it back together is God himself. And he has done everything needed to put those pieces back together. And I'm not talking put the pieces back together. You know, I've broken things before. It's hard to believe. For example, one time as a child, um, I was probably 10 or 11. We got BB guns. <laughs> yeah, you know where the story's going. And my dad was, was a collector of sorts. He had stacks and stacks and piles and piles of, you know, sheet metal and T-posts and PVC pipe, all on these, you know, on these sawhorses and stuff on the back part of our property. And one time he had this little camper shell on this little Mitsubishi truck that he sold the truck, but he kept the camper shell. My dad never owned another truck that size in his life, but he kept the camper shell because it could be used for something. Guess what I used it for? Target practice. And I, I shot out the side window on that camper. By the way, this is the first time I've ever actually admitting to doing this. <laughs> Mom doesn't care. She's like, whatever. I hated that. I hated that. Those piles of junk anyway. All right. She wanted to be out there with me. And uh, and so what I did as that it was just a tiny little hole, but then it just spider webbed. So what did I try to do? I'm trying to glue the pieces back together. Well, I didn't make it worse. Y'all are like, oh my goodness. No, I didn't. It, did it work? No, it did not work. Now, imagine your soul has been shattered like that camper window. Everything that you and I try to do is like a preteen with a bottle of super glue trying to, trying to put all the pieces back together. It doesn't work. It's futile. You can walk away thinking, man, I did a really good job. No one's ever going to find that out. And God's just behind you shaking, shaking his head going, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen you try to do. It's foolish. We are called to proclaim to people their need to be reconciled to God. But not just their need to be reconciled with God. Anybody can come along and say, hey, that's broken. Where the skill comes in is, or the truth comes in, is when someone comes by and tells you how to fix it. When someone steps into your life and shows you how to put the pieces back together and the how to put the pieces back together according to the gospel is not, well, start attending church and start reading your Bible and start giving to the church and start serving in the nursery. Those don't put the pieces back together. What puts the pieces back together is that you realize you are broken and you cry out to your maker, the only one who can put you back together. 
The one who did die on the cross for your sins. The one who did rise from the grave to demonstrate that he was the Messiah. That he is the Messiah. The one who fulfilled all of the promises and law of God. The one, the only, Jesus Christ. You fall on him for grace and mercy. And Jesus says, anyone who comes to me, I will not cast out. You don't have to fix anybody. Jesus does that. Your responsibility and my responsibility is simply to tell them, be reconciled to God. There's brokenness and only Jesus can fix it. Only Jesus can heal you. Only Jesus can take what is old and replace it with something new. Only Jesus can make you a new creation. Every disciple is sent as an ambassador. We've been given the message. It requires zero creativity on us to figure out what we're going to say to people. You know, well, pastor, don't we have to know when the right time is? Well, just hold on. We've got one more point to go through. Every disciple is sent as an ambassador in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, in John chapter 20, he does something that there's really no clear explanation of. There are two different theories on what Jesus does here, but he looks at the disciples and he breathes on them in verse 22 and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, we know in Acts chapter 2 that the Spirit falls and the Spirit abides on the disciples and it radically transforms their ministry from that day forward. So what is this about? There are some ideas. The first idea is that Jesus is kind of foreshadowing that they will receive the Spirit in about a month's time or so. That Jesus ministers for 40 days. The disciples receive the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. That was about 10 days after Jesus ascended. So some people think, well, Jesus is kind of showing them what's going to happen. Others believe that Jesus gives a temporary imparting of the Holy Spirit, kind of like what you see in the Old Testament, that the Holy Spirit came and rested on people and then it left, like Samson. That the Spirit would come upon Samson, or the Spirit would even come upon King Saul at points. It, it, it kind of ascended and descended. And this is G the last temporary filling of the spirit before he fell once and for all. It doesn't really matter what your view on that is. What we do know is this, is that Jesus says, as the father has sent me, I send you and also receive the Holy Spirit. And then he tells the disciples after his ascension, stay in Jerusalem until the power from on, um, from on high comes upon you. And then when you receive power from the Holy Spirit, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. We cannot do this job without the Holy Spirit. We cannot do it. I'm not saying you can't do it well. I'm saying you can't do it, period. We won't last. We will not hold up under the weight and responsibility of carrying this message with us. We are not only encouraged by the Holy Spirit, we are divinely filled and empowered to this ministry. You lack nothing, believer, in fulfilling the job that Jesus Christ has set in front of you. You don't lack a thing. God has given you everything you need to be obedient and faithful to this call. He's given you the message. He's given you the method, speaking and living, and he's given you the power. The Holy Spirit undergirds you and compels you and fuels you all the time. And going back to that, you don't even know what, have to say, what you have to say. Jesus says in, earlier in the Gospel of John that when, they're, when you're hauled before authorities and rulers, you don't even have to worry about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will give you the words. When you're talking with your neighbor or with your spouse, or with your kids, or with your grandkids, or the kids at school, or the other teachers at school, or your coworkers, or your bosses, or the cashiers at Brookshire's, or whoever it is, that you, if you have been faithful, if you've been filling yourself up with scriptures, if, if you've been praying continually, as God tells us to do, if you are faithful in following Jesus in your everyday life, you will see the opportunities that God has laid in front of you and you will know what to say. 
you will know. Now remember this. Your job is not to be perfect. Your job is not to do everything right every step of the way. Your job is to be faithful. Your job is to trust that Jesus knows what he's doing. Your job is to trust that you are a new creation in Christ and this new creation has been created for more than just sitting in a church. It's more than just serving in the nursery or just giving, not that those are ennoble things, but we are, we are set apart for eternal purposes and that includes declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever God chooses to send us. At home, across the street, around the corner, or the other side of the globe. Our job is to cover the earth with the good news of Jesus Christ because we are ambassadors that are sent out. That is our purpose. That's our purpose. It's so easy to believe that our purpose becomes something else. Our purpose is to cover the earth with the gospel realizing and believing and trusting that there is no other force on the planet other than the church that is tasked with this mission. There is no substitute. A word of warning before we close. We're entering a, the election cycle soon. And while civic duties and civic authorities matter, Never, ever believe the lie that a legislator or a judge or a president should be the ones proclaiming the gospel for the church. It's our job. It's us. In America, in Uganda, in France, in Spain, and in every other place on the face of the planet, it is the church's privilege and responsibility, duty, and weight to be the ones who stand up and say, Jesus Christ is the Savior. Be reconciled to God. Never put your hope in anybody else other than Jesus. Your hope is in Christ. With that said, go and do your civic duty. Pray, vote your conscience. Vote as believers in accordance with God's word as best as you can discern that and then trust that God will be, is still in control. Trust that God will work his will in our nation, in our life, and around the world according to his good pleasure and his divine power. But don't you dare get distracted from the mission that God has set in front of you. We are ambassadors of something better than civic local state or federal politics we are ambassadors of something better than sports opinions and sports teams we are bearers of the eternal good news of Jesus Christ church let's fix our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith and let us run this race that he has set before us achieving the purpose that he has laid out for us let us go and proclaim to the world be reconciled to God. Let's pray. As we prepare to pray, just want to invite those who maybe have not been reconciled to God through faith in Jesus Christ. You've heard the message this morning. I pray that you'd hear the Spirit as He says, Yes, you're broken because of sin, and that doesn't make you worthless, it doesn't make you unlovable. God, in fact, has offered his love and grace and mercy to you that through Jesus Christ, you can be forgiven of your sin. You can be rescued from your brokenness. You can be made new in Christ. If you've not known Jesus, if you've not trusted in Christ, if you've not been saved by faith in him, the invitation is open. Be reconciled to God today. Don't wait another day. Don't wait for... God, to send you a Damascus Road moment because there's no guarantee he will. You've heard the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hear the Spirit calling you to salvation. It's faith. 
to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Call upon the name of the Lord to rescue you from your sin and he will do so. If that's you, we'd love to celebrate that with you, but you don't have to come down front to be saved. Talk to Jesus where you are. For those of you who are believers, and it's been a long time since you've spoken out as an ambassador of the gospel, know that this message is not intended to guilt anybody, but many of us are grieved because of our lack of faithfulness in this area. The message wasn't intended to grieve, but we, pray, we praise God that we are. May that grief lead to sorrow and that sorrow lead to repentance and that repentance lead to life, life in our tongues that we speak the truth of Jesus. Father, help us to do those things. Help those who are not saved to see their need and repent and believe in this moment. Help those of us who are saved, help us to be ready and willing, so filled with the word and filled with the spirit that we can't help but speak the good news of Jesus. Help us to be faithful, vocal, kind, humble, loving servant ambassadors sent out by the King of kings and Lord of lords. It's in his name we pray. Amen.